of students will be seeing this presentation afterward, I suppose. So straight away, yeah, let's start me, uh, with the presentation. Yeah, please. please. Uh, let me introduce Dr. Sukalyan Chakravarti. He is an associate professor in civil and engineering, environmental engineering, sorry. And he has done his M MSc PhD from Kalyani University and a postdoctoral fellowship from University of South Australia and National Ching, Ching Kung University. And he has more than 14 years of experience. So we welcome you. And uh, we have seen lots of publication. You have uh, worked in the field of environmental engineering. So we welcome you. So uh, please start the session. OK. Uh, thank you, madam. Thank you. So. Let me start with the presentation. I would like to present one PowerPoint presentation over here. Oh, I think in Google Meet we cannot do that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can you see the presentation? PowerPoint? Yeah, it is visible. Okay. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> we are actually standing at a time when sustainable development and sustainable environment globally of the whole world is a topic uh, which is much talked about. A lot of initiatives are being taken throughout the world for uh, a sustainable environment because uh, we have realized maybe from last two decades we have realized that uh, the trend of development that we have been engaged with is not a sustainable one it might give you short-term benefit but uh, in the long run if you see then um, actually we have realized that we are not going for a sustainable development and in this way we cannot achieve a sustainable environment in the future. So that's why uh, now a lot of initiatives are being taken. People are made aware of the things that we need to have an environment which can sustain our future, not only our future, the future of our future generations. That also needs to be sustained. Okay. So... Uh, like uh, you people have been enrolled in this course for sustainable uh, sustainability science where you study about many things which says that actually what has been the gaps what has been the lacunae of uh, the environment pattern that we have been following till now or the development pattern rather say we have been following till now so uh, is that a sustainable or one or we need to do something else which can make this a more sustainable one so today basically i will be concentrating my presentation on land and soil resources along with water resources uh, for uh, uh, for a sustainable environment now, when I say the term sustainable environment, I have to know a few things about this, about these uh, topics like land, soil, and water. It is, the, it is comprising of the uh, technical things that we should know about the land, soil, and water before we really plunged into uh, the sustainable development of those resources. Like, what are the characteristics? What are the physical characteristics? What are the chemical characteristics? What biology is associated with that? Unless and until we know these factors, we cannot chalk out the ecology of those ecosystems. And finally, what is happening to the existing things? How we are dilapidating these resources? And finally, what we can do for these resources so that these resources remain as a sustainable natural resource and we can utilize it in such a judicious manner so that our future generations can also benefit from it. 
So I'll start my presentation with uh, land resource. <clears throat> Whenever you have any question, you can ask me, I think. Okay, so talking about land resources, first of all, let me tell you that land is a life support system. Uh, basically, when we talk about land or pictureize about land, we see some uh, landscape structures in front of us. But apart from the structures that we see from our, uh, see in front of us, in front of our eyes, we have to realize that life, uh, that land is actually a life support system. How? We all are heterotrophic organisms. We do not prepare our own food, right? We need the food from other organisms. Now, how do the other organisms um, grow? They grow. If you see all the heterotrophs, the herbivores, the carnivores, we, the human beings, we are all dependent on plants. Plant is the first trophic level of the ecosystem. It can be any ecosystem where it acts as a producer for the whole ecosystem. It harnesses the solar energy, captures the minerals from the soil and take um, water from the soil and then with the help of this perform photosynthesis and finally produces some biochemicals called glucose this glucose is actually you can say the source of sustenance of the whole world because this glucose leads to energy requirement of the plant themselves and the rest of the glucose they get accumulated as biomass so feeding on that biomass actually the whole earth is surviving. So who is the starting point of this total ecological energetics? The plants are the starting point. And how will the plants grow? The plants need nutrition. The plants need a place where they can uh, exist themselves. They can, they can grow themselves. And that entity is land. It stores nutrients and moisture for plants. And as I have told you, indirectly for all other organisms via the ecological food chain or food wave. So that's why I tell you, land is a life supporting system. Productivity is a factor of environment and edaphic conditions. Now, if you see the vegetation profile of the whole world, you will find that maximum diversity of plants are found in the tropical region. Why? The first reason is climate. The temperature, the precipitation pattern, which supports the maximum diversity of plants in the tropical region. If you move on to the temperate region and then to the polar region, you will find a progressive decline in the plant diversity as you move from the equator towards the poles. So the climatic pattern as well as the edaphic condition. Edaphic condition means soil condition. That is again a very deterministic factor for the productivity of the plants. So these two factors combined, they give rise to the productivity of the plants. What will be? How much the plant will grow? How will it reproduce? How, uh, how many offshoots will come out from each plant? So that actually is the question of productivity. And it is solely dependent on, you can say, two factors. One is the climatic regime of that place and the edaphic conditions, the soil conditions. In our country also, if you see somewhere you have, you know, black soil. If you see the peninsular part, uh, Maharashtra, they have black soil. If you see uh, the banks of the rivers, you have alluvial soil. If you see in the some of the regions, you will find lateritic soil. So different types of soils are there. And what type of plants will be growing over there? It is totally dependent on the soil factors. So here you can understand the importance of land. But now the question arises that, okay, we have these resources. So what is actually the problem with it? The problem is the 
ever growing population of our of our planet which has reached 9 billion now so this ever growing population needs to be fed and for providing food to this huge magnanimous population of the world what have we done we have engaged ourselves into many unsustainable land use practices which gave rise to the need of sustainable development if you see the graph over here you find this is the growth rate of the population till one uh, uh, point of time there were a lot of diseases prevailing so there were a lot of deaths but after that with the advancement of medical science as well as science and technological advancement took the total life span of human beings it has increased that one and finally from this point you can see from 1927 it started increasing and it has been a sharp increase of population till now though uh, worldwide lot of initiatives are being taken to slow down this process so that we have a, a sustainable environment and we actually cope up with the carrying capacity of our earth so we need to shift from these unsustainable land use practices to sustainable and judicious land use practices now if i see some technical details about the land as a resource it is the part of the lithosphere lithosphere is the um, solid part of the earth which you know it's composed of uh, the crust the mantle the core okay so this is the solid part that is the lithosphere and this is the region where plants are growing so this is the zone of biological production what are the components of land how uh, money what comprises the land what makes up the land it is soil which has it got uh, which has got its own physical chemical properties vegetation organisms uh, when i say organism it both the macro organisms as well as the micro organisms topography topography means land features whether it's a plain land whether it's a valley whether it's a plateau etc the climatic regime and the anthropogenic activities so these are you can say the components of land now what is the importance of knowing this if we want to go for sustainable practice if we want a sustainable development of the land resource we have to know what are its components which needs to be preserved conserved or developed now uh, food and fodder production transport economic activities recreation waste disposal this actually all comes under anthropogenic activities of the land so if you have to um, manage the land resources you have to focus on all these areas uh, actually when we want sustainable development of anything we have to grossly think about it we cannot separate out one component and just uh, develop that component we have to develop we have to go for a holistic development of all the components so that finally we uh, can develop that resource uh, sustainably now another thing that uh, you need to know when we talk about land is its land use classifications okay so i know what are the components of the land the next thing is what are the different types of land use classification like what are the different types of land uses land use patterns going on there are various land use patterns like here you can see forests uh, of course a lot of vegetation would be there land not available for cultivation here i am talking about the barren and waste land which has lost all its productivity and you cannot go grow crops or plants over there so land not available for cultivation uncultivated land it's the grazing and pastures okay it is not used for agriculture um, but basically this is uh, under the use of uh, grazing and pasture activities of the livestock fallow land fallow land is that land which has been left uncultivated for uh, for one or less year okay but it might again be converted into 
cultivable land. Culturable wasteland left uncultivated for more than five years. You will find this also a pattern in many places which has not been cultivated for more than five years. It does not have any vegetation also, maybe some uh, erratic wild uh, bushes or herbs are growing over there. So that's culturable wasteland. Net sown area, that means uh, out of the total cultivated land, what I am saying, net sown area is a rain fed and the agricultural land. And land put to non-agricultural uses, uh, of course, where we are uh, making our roads, buildings, bridges, etc. So that is land put to non-agricultural uses. It includes anthropogenic Euclidean features. That means sharp geometric features um, uh, components are present over there. So uh, these are the different uses of land. These are some of the different uses of land. Apart from that, there are uh, many other uses of land. So according to that, we can classify to the total land surface into uh, these uses. <coughs> now, some uh, areas or some land resources have multiple and compound utilization type. That means more than one kind of land use within an area. If you see this picture, it is actually a forest land. But it is also a recreational area where people are going for trails and all those activities. So it's a multiple used land. That means it is having a compound utilization type. Actually, managing this, this type of uh, land uses are very difficult because you have to take into account many components at the same time when you try to manage them. What are the land characteristics? So, uh, the basic land characteristics are slope angle. Um, what is the slope? What is the gradient of the land over there? The rainfall pattern of that land, the soil texture, the water holding capacity. Uh, actually, the soil texture and water holding capacity and bulk density. These are some of the physical features of uh, land, you can say, uh, which uh, are actually the result of the soil characteristics over there. Okay, and they determine how much uh, vegetation will be growing over there. You have, uh, say, you have dry lands or arid lands in the western part of our country, where you find the water holding capacity of the soil is very low. So what happens? The moisture content of that land is less, and so less vegetation is growing over there. Now, when I talk about these features, soil texture, um, say, moisture holding capacity etc they can be either positive or negative like moisture availability moisture availability um, can be very low or it can be moderate which is good for vegetation or sometimes it can be very high very high means we are talking about waterlogged soils they are also not good for all types of vegetation erosion resistance some land uh, some uh, land resources are very um, i mean prone to erosion Okay, it depends on the structure and texture of the soil also. Flooding hazard is again uh, one of the characteristic which is uh, related to the structure and texture of the soil. Nutritive value of the pasture. So these are the characteristics of land. Okay, I was talking about unsustainable land use practices. Okay, so once uh, by now we know what are the land components, what are the land, different types of land uses, and what are the land characteristics. Now, once we know all about these, the next thing that we should know is what are the unsustainable practices that are going on, um, which is leading to a depletion of the land resources. So here I jot down the unsustainable land use practices. Overpopulation. Overpopulation is the basic cause of unsustainable land use practice. Overexploitation. Uh, of course, when there is overpopulation, there would be overexploitation because the carrying capacity remains the same of any ecosystem. And when the population increases, what happens? They all compete for the same resources. So that leads to overexploitation. Pollution. Uh, that is the byproduct of the uses, destruction of natural resources. Now, all these things, you know, it varies from one location to another. 
sometimes uh, in some of the places the uh, soil is very dry the soil is very arid no moisture very less vegetation so what happens animals surviving over there the uh, herbivores surviving over there they all compete for the um, limited number of vegetation which is present over there so at that time what happens exploitation rate is very high but in some other places if you compare some forest with it the biomass of the vegetation is so high that the total herbivores remaining over there are quite satisfied and not only that there is very less over exploitation over there so why these unsustainable practices we human beings are more uh, interested in short term benefits okay so due to short term benefits uh, we do many activities which lead to um, land uh, resource depletion so i give you one example of short term benefits say i want high productivity of crops in my small uh, land area which i have for cultivation so what do i do i go for a number of things first of all i go for high yielding variety seeds second i apply lot of fertilizers into it to prevent insects and rodents and all these things i apply lot of pesticides and insecticides rodenticides there finally um, when the crops are grow growing i get good productivity from the crops so that's my short term benefit but what happened in this process first of all we all are um, inclining towards only high yielding variety seeds so what is happening due to that many seeds or many varieties of plants and crops which existed uh, even a few years earlier maybe one or two decades earlier they are no more found because all are interested in only high yielding variety seeds so diversity loss second is lot of pesticides and insecticides that do synthetic has been applied out of which only 5 to 10% is utilized by the plants rest 85 uh, sorry 90 to 95% remains in the soil and whenever there is precipitation it either infiltrates into the ground water or through runoff it goes to the water bodies finally leading to much uh, greater problems due to water pollution curbed under government policies a lot of time we have to uh, adopt these measures uh, through government policies also extreme weather conditions overpopulation i have already told you deforestation and effluent discharge lead to erosion and desertification desertification is a process uh, which is actually the depletion of the land resource i mean uh, uh, depletion of the quality of the land resource uh, where the productivity of the land is lost due to deforestation erosion and uh, dumping of wastes into it so these are all the reasons which are leading to unsustainable land use practices effects erosion desertification collapse of fisheries uh, and other resource stocks groundwater depletion soil salinization toxic mine waste dumps species extinction uncontrolled urbanization and migration these are all the topics uh, which again requires a lot of discussion but uh, here just for reference i am telling you that these are the effects of unsustainable land use practices it is leading to finally it is leading to land degradation loss of potential to produce biomass due to natural anthropogenic causes almost 1/6th of the land of the world already degraded okay so that's a huge amount 35% uh, sorry out of which 38% is light degraded 46 moderately degraded and 16% is extremely degraded what has been the causes 84% by water and wind erosion jahan pe plants nahi rahega the aggravation of soil erosion will happen over there and by wind and water what will happen the top soil the fertile soil will move out will go with the runoff so finally the land which was fertile once now gets converted into a unproductive land chemical degradation by dumping of liquid and solid wastes uh, 
or even uh, by processes of acid rain and similar phenomenon in many places, the land gets degraded. Physical degradation, physical degradation is again uh, some of the erosion which are happening due to uh, growing deforestation. Out of the whole world, Africa and Central America is most affected due to this. Causes I have already, uh, uh, I think, discussed. When countries are undergoing economic development, we uh, need more and more industrialization, more and more mining, and due to this, we are degrading the land resources. Okay, so I'll just skip this one. So now, how it can be managed? It's called SLM. Sustainable Land Management. It's a knowledge-based procedure to integrate. As I told you, it's a holistic approach. It needs to integrate various components of the land. Then only we can have a sustainable land management. Like you cannot develop water resources without developing land resources or vice versa. So all the resources which are interconnected in nature, they need to be simultaneously developed. We need to integrate many components together. So it's a knowledge-based procedure to integrate land, water, biodiversity, and environmental management and stop and reverse degradation in a sustainable fashion. It's a holistic approach overlapping with water management, soil conservation, livestock management. So all these things has to be looked after when we are going for the holistic uh, land management approaches. It is governed by a complex set of socio-economic development and environmental parameters like land use planning. Uh, first thing that we need to do when we go for sustainable land management is we have to assess what are the various land use and land cover patterns of that area. So that we can identify what are the components that I need to develop. So first step is land use planning and evaluation. The second step is integrated land management. So questions which need to be answered in this land evaluation, how is the land currently managed? What will happen if the present practices remain unchanged, whether it is leading to a degradation or it is okay? What improvement in management practices are possible? What other uses of land are physically possible and economically and socially relevant? Now, uh, uh, this is a very important component we need to always keep in mind when we go for environment management, that is socio-economic management. Socio-economic uh, management is utterly important when we uh, think about managing any environmental resource. Which of these uses offer possibilities of sustained production benefits? What and say, I want to go for reclamation of a uh, degraded land due to mining activities. So how do I do? How do I go for it? I find out first how much damage has been done. Second, what are the relief features that has been created by the mining activities in that region? Third, how can I go for reclamation of that area. Reclamation means what? Regaining the originality of that place which was prevailing over there before the mining activities. Now, here I need to go for the socio-economic consideration also because after developing or reclaiming this uh, mine degraded land, would it be offering employment opportunities to the people? Would it be leading to livelihood generation of the local people? Would it be leading to a sustainable life process of the local people over there? So these are the considerations which are generally taken uh, when we think of uh, reclamation of land. So socioeconomic uh, uh, factor is very important. What current inputs are necessary to bring about the desired production and minimize the adverse effects? What are the benefits of each form of use? So this is called integrated land management. How do we do the integrated land management? Identify the requirements and need of all the stakeholders, the people living over there, or even other stakeholders whose interest is bowed over there. Data on physical, social, and economic condition of the land. Evaluate current and potential land conditions. Identify special planning units. Uh, opportunity for discussion and establish infrastructure for agreed upon land use and management. I think the example that I have given you 
covers all these aspects land reclamation so uh, these are the things like what are the needs uh, which need to be incorporated in that area what are the status of the components how they can be improved and after improvement how it will be generating sustainable livelihood for the people over there and also the other stakeholders related to that so that's integrated land management for that we need a lot of uh, role of science and technology to be playing in it um, like uh, gis tools and various surveillance systems are used uh, to find out like aerial photographs satellite images uh, these are uh, generally used to find out what is the land use and land cover pattern over there what is the uh, extent of the uh, shrinkage of the forest cover over there so what are the current conditions of that area can be studied by these computer based gis tools and surveillance systems okay so this is very much required when we want to develop the physical biological and the social aspects of an of a land resource what are the constraints limited access to appropriate information and technology actually you know uh, there is uh, a very uh, prominent problem prevailing uh, between this uh, science and technology persons who are working on the land use land cover patterns and the policy makers who are going for development activities so there is a huge gap between these two uh, sections which need to be bridged so that we have the uh, correct knowledge about the components of the land resource or of any resource so that finally we can take up those developmental steps which can lead to sustainable development weakness in institutional infrastructure unsustainable land use practice existing conflicts between land use goals conflicts between land use goals is another factor uh, which often becomes a problem for land reclamation like um, uh, the local people want something like in uh, some other stakeholders who might be coming for the development project their um, demand is something else so there is always a conflict between the land use goals which are to be achieved i think you can go through this uh, data which are there uh, pertaining to the land use management in india okay so uh, if you have any question we can have a uh, quick round of discussion on land resource and then i move on to soil resources any question uh, can i make things clear for you acha i don't know whether uh, you are allowed to mm. yeah okay yeah ma'am uh, they are allowed to speak i mean they can yeah speak? they are yeah they are allowed to they can unmute and they can speak yeah so could you understand what i have been trying to impart when student have asked can we doctor doctor kalyan i mean uh, yeah प्रेजेंटेशन दट इज सॉयल रिसोर्स सो फॉर we have been discussing about the land resources now we all know that soil is basically the uh, building block or uh, you can say units of land that makes up the land resource that makes up the qualities of the land resource now concept of soil is um, it's a interface between atmosphere and lithosphere uh, 
it has different physical, um, mineralogical, and chemical factors. I'll go to the next slide. Uh, this is the process of soil formation. It's called pedogenesis. Like, uh, first thing is it is dependent on the rock material uh, from which the soil is uh, formed. And uh, several other factors are also there, uh, which uh, actually determines what type of soil would be formed uh, and what is the type of the process which will be existing in a particular land. So these are the factors you can see climate. Climate is a very important factor in um, uh, the soil formation process that is pedogenesis because uh, the soil, the temperature and the precipitation uh, uh, most prominently, uh, it makes up the moisture content of the soil. And the moisture content it, itself determines what will be the process of the soil formation, uh, like uh, whether it will be a very fertile soil or not, whether the process of humification, that is decomposition of the organic matter will be happening optimally or not. And if it is a dry soil, the fertility is a bit less because uh, humification activities, uh, they are very less over there. So climate is a very important factor which determines the soil formation process. Apart from that, organisms. Organisms, basically we are talking about uh, microorganisms as well as uh, macroorganisms, plants and animals surviving over there. Like uh, what are their excreta, what are their um, shaded parts which reaches the land surface and finally acted upon the microorgan acted upon by the microorganisms. Relief. Relief means the gradient, the uh, slope of that place, uh, whether the uh, top soil, that is the organic matter content of the soil, remain over there or it uh, flows down. What happens? It depends on the relief. Parent material is the rock and time. Time is, of course, uh, one of the uh, reaction variable of the soil formation process. So finally, that determines what will be the soil properties. And uh, finally, this is the soil profile, which uh, if you start digging the soil from the surface and go uh, depth wise down, you find there are different layers of soil. The first layer is actually the fresh litter. That means the leaves and uh, flowers and fruits which are falling on the surface. So very rich organic matter layer. And this organic matter is actually uh, decomposed by the organisms present over there. So next layer, it is the organic horizon originating from the litter deposited on surface. So this is undecomposed, the first layer. Then you have the decomposed layer. Then you have the mineral horizon at surface formed by incorporation of organic matter. This is actually a mixed, mixed layer where the mineral matters which actually comes from the rock, parent rock, they uh, migrate here or uh, by the weathering process, they come over here and they also mix with the organic matter from the upper layers and they form the A horizon. So O horizon was completely organic matter. A horizon is a mixture of organic matter as well as the minerals. Then you have the B horizon, which is um, having coarser particles in it, uh, characterized by clay, silicate, iron accumulation. So mineral content increases, organic matter content decreases here. C horizon is again the unconsolidated, uh, just broken down from the parent rock. So these are the unconsolidated or weakly consolidated horizon is the C horizon. And finally, the last one is the rocks, that is the D horizon, parent material or bedrock. So if you see the soil uh, uh, um, transverse section, longitudinal section of the soil from the top to the bottom, it is actually comprising of these layers, horizons. So what happens when there is erosion, runoff, the upper organic matter rich layer, first of all, washed, gets washed away. Then this layer, which is again a very important layer, A horizon for the plants to grow, this layer also starts getting eroded. 
by real erosion run off erosion sheet erosion jise kehte hain so due to this what happens finally ye upar ke jo do layers hai o horizon and a horizon if they get washed away then the productivity of the soil gets depleted now soil components as we have seen that the land is composed of many components and soil is a component of that again we see here what are the components of soil itself the soil components are minerals around 45% organic matter 5% water 20 to 30% that is the soil moisture which is present in between the pore spaces uh, uh, which is present in the pore spaces in between the soil particles and air also which is present in between the soil particles so uh, as the moisture increases actually the air decreases pore spaces are filled up with water so these are the things which are found in uh, soil which makes up the um, bulk of soil now when we talk about characteristics of soil the first thing that we need to know about soil is its texture that means uh, what is the soil type if you uh, take a pinch of soil uh, within your two fingers and rub it how do you feel that's called the texture now this texture depends on the particle size of the soil over there like it can be sandy soil it can be silty soil it can be clay or it can be um, gravels so this is the size difference uh, here you can see this one size difference clay less than 0.002 mm so that means what texture is very smooth clay soil you find in the bank of the rivers alluvial soil is clay soil uh, its porosity is very less that's why this soil is very good for rice cultivation which requires water locked condition then if you see the silt silt is quite big the particle size of silt is quite big than uh, clay it is 0.05 to 0.002 0.002 mm and sand you can see how big is this size compared to clay and silt so when you pick up a sandy soil in your hand you find it very coarse okay so particle size of the uh, soil particles actually determines what is the texture and not only that it determines what will be the porosity and permeability within that soil mass soil structure now what happens the soil particles they bind among themselves as well as the moisture Uh, due to the forces of cohesion and adhesion and they form certain structures like this granular where you find uh, like granules blocky okay blocky soil you find in many mainly uh, degraded soil platy soil again you find in degraded soil massive soil where you find chunks of soil coming together and single grain is actually a very dry soil so out of this uh, different uh, soil structures the granular soil structure is the best for plant growth apart from that uh, soil organic matter it is actually uh, the organic matter when we talk about organic matter is the carbon so dead remains of green plants animal residue and excreta acted upon by various microorganisms Uh, actually what happens when microorganisms uh, decompose the organic matter uh, two things happen immobilization and mineralization immobilization is some of the carbon from this organic matter is uh, contributing to the biomass of the or uh, body mass of the organisms so that's immobilization and mineralization is conversion of complex organic material into inorganic materials both these things happen when there is organic matter decomposition so we throw away uh, kitchen waste we throw away um, fruits waste and other organic matter we cut down trees uh, throw away the leaves 
what happens to that? They have complex organic matters. When they go to the soil, the decomposers start degrading them and convert them into simple inorganic carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur. Sulfur may not be carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen elements into the soil. And that again forms the nutrient pool of the land. So these soil properties, um, uh, soil properties ki jo hum yaha pe paat ki hai, structure or texture ki, they are actually um, to a great extent determined by the soil organic matter, SOM. And they um, finally give rise to certain properties like uh, loosening of soil. If it's a good organic matter rich soil, then the soil is very loose. That means what? Number of pore is very high. Number of pore is very high means what? Root penetration will be good. Aeration of the root will be possible. And infiltration of the water is also possible. So this is a condition where the growth of plants will be very good. Larger organic material absorbs more moisture. Apart from this, moisture, uh, organic matter has an ability to absorb moisture. So what happens, those soil which are rich in organic matter, they uh, have a better water holding capacity. Okay, And smaller particles act as glue. What we have seen in clay soil. The particles are so small that they, due to cohesion, they stick to each other. And they do not provide any space in between them for water to percolate. So that becomes a waterlogged soil. So organic matter actually um, um, gives rise to several properties of the soil. Then we have soil organisms. Uh, so far I have been talking about the decomposition many a times. So the soil organisms are very Sorry, important. Dr. Sukalyan, this is Bhupesh. Yes. So, yes. doctor, I mean, uh, SOM is very important for the fertility of the soil, but there are certain crops like which, you know, uh, uh, requires less water and not very fertile soil. I mean, if we try to grow those kind of crops mm. in these kind of high SOM yes. rich soil, yes, yes, so yes, yes. that, I mean, uh, the chances of crop failure is very high. Yes, 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 you are very correct. Because some of the plants are there which require less moisture, which requires very less watering. So if organic matter is rich over there, uh, actually the water holding capacity of the soil increases and that leads, leads to failure of the growth of those plants. You are correct. Yeah, that varies from one place to another. Like uh, as I told you that for rice, we need waterlogged soil. But for other plants, we do not do not need waterlogged soil. Okay, so uh, yeah, organic matter actually increases the water holding capacity of the soil. It might be favorable for some crops, might not be for others. You are correct. Yes, doctor. I mean, here I mean, uh, why I am asking this question? I mean, every soil is, I mean, no soil is uh, useless. It we must we should know for what purpose it is suitable for an example uh, i mean uh, uh, i mean i am see uh, let's uh, my own experience based on my ex own experience mm -hmm. if we try to give uh, more water to papaya crop i mean failure chances of failure is very high mm -hmm. yes 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 it, it can yes. be grown in uh, you know less fertile soil less, as well uh, less uh, water holding capacity yeah. soil yes, yes. Yeah, um, uh, you know, the statement that you have given, uh, no soil is uh, useless. It's a very correct statement uh, because there are several plants which grows in arid and semi-arid condition only. So if we have arid and semi-arid condition soil, we can grow those plant, those plant species over there. Like if you say acacia, baboon, these plants grows in only less moisture soil or uh, less fertile soil yes doctor yes. in fact uh, uh, like the, the 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 best fruit india produces the ratnagiri mangoes i mean i tried to cultivate in uttar pradesh 
and I, I was unsuccessful. And but you know, in the in the this uh, Ratnagiri region, mm. where the soil is rocky, and mm. you find the best quality of yes, mango yes, from that yes, region. Yes, 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 yes. Like even in large tracts of Gujarat and Rajasthan, lot of uh, zatropha has been grown because that requires very less maintenance. Correct. So, and we all know that zatropha plants have got many uh, benefits from it. We can get oil from it. So, no soil is useless. Uh, doctor, correct me if my if my understanding is wrong. It it is also one of the suitable plant for nitrogen fixation. Is that true? Yeah. Uh, I'm not quite sure about that because, uh, see, for nitrogen fixation, uh, basically we know that leguminous plants are very important, yeah. which have which nodules, nodules in their, in their roots. roots. Yeah, like grams and this, yes, yes, uh, arhar, yes. etc. Yes. So, what happens? The symbiotic bacteria, rhizobacteria, uh, uh, they, the rhizobacter, they come and colonize over there, and there is a symbiotic relation between the plant and the microbe for nitrogen fixation. Actually, it is done by the done by microbes. The... They convert the atmospheric yeah. nitrogen into uh, available form. Uh, I'm not quite sure about uh, Zatropa's role in nitrogen fixation. Maybe, I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. So, Zatropha is like the substitute of diesel, biodiesel. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, got it. Lipid is extracted and then yes. it is transesterified. Yes, 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 sir. Uh, yes. Uh, this jetrophy can be used as green leaf manure, sir, because yeah, that uh, leaves having uh, that leaves having highest nitrogen content, so that can be used as green leaf manure. In that, uh, there will be role in jetrophy, sir. But about uh, this, uh, but about uh, this. Uh, yes. Ah, about uh, this nitrogen fixation, uh, it may not, sir. Uh, but uh, this uh, leaves as you, this leaves can be used as green leaf manure. Okay, its nitrogen content is very high. Okay. Good. Yes, yes, sir. So it can be used as a supplement or substitute of nitrogenous fertilizer (NPK). I mean, yes, yes. In yes. NPK, N part it yes. will take. Yes. 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 It can be composted. So okay. Okay. So, should we proceed? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, just now we were talking about this only. Soil nutrients, fertility and quality. The quality of the soil is dependent on the uh, on its nutrient content. When I say nutrient is either macronutrient or micronutrient. Like... Uh, you know that nitrates, phosphates, and potassium, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, these are the macro elements which are required for plant growth. And micro elements, iron, boron, zinc, copper, these are there. Secondary elements, these are also required for plant growth, that is calcium, magnesium, and sulfur in less quantities. So the soil which is having these nutrients in sufficient quantities, of course, the fertility of the soil will be high and uh, plants will be growing. Uh, very good over there. Management of soil fertility. Yeah, uh, actually we have started discussing about these things that how uh, green manures can be used like uh, some of the organic uh, approaches for managing the soil fertility. Because I have told that uh, using synthetic fertilizers and uh, pesticides as you know that it creates a lot of environmental problems. Long-term strategy to reduce the loss of nutrients and build soil fertility through continuous nourishment. So these are the two areas which we need to address when we uh, want to increase the fertility of the soil. The first one is uh, check the loss of nutrients. That means we have to check the erosion so that the top soil, which is the most fertile part, it does not get eroded away. And second one is continuous nourishment. Continuous nourishment means we have to um, increase the um, macronutrients and micronutrient content in the soil. Okay, So it varies greatly with geography, climate, uh, 
traditional practices uh, what are the things that can be done like organic or biological farming crop rotation biodiversity conservation green manure here you can see in the picture that green manure is being given okay as uh, one of you have told that uh, zatrofa leaves are rich in nitrogen content so it can be used as a green manure several such uh, organic substances which are uh, actually we term them as biomass waste they can be composted and they can be applied then crop rotation is a technique again which um, actually helps the soil to replenish its fertility like uh, we were talking about uh, different types of grams leguminous plants bengal grams and all these grams plants plantation of these plants lead to improvement of the soil by more and more nitrogen fixation from the atmosphere so we can go for crop rotation integrated pest management uh, integrated pest management is uh, mainly relying on um, bio predators so like uh, uh, minimizing the use of synthetic pesticides so that comes integrated pest management nutrient enhancement by legumes and good tilling tilling uh, increases the oxygen content of the soil aeration zyada hota hai isse agriculture soil quality and sustainability uh, uh, i think we have already discussed about these things so i skip this one these are the soil types according to icar eight major soil types which we are having in our country um, deep and medium black soil alluvial soil red and yellow laterite saline desert forest and hill okay so these are the alluvial soil you find in the bank of the rivers black soil you find in this region red soil is actually the laterite soil forest and mountain soil which is very high in humus uh, humic acid fulvic acid these are very high arid and desert soil which are dry soils saline soil near the coastlines and peaty and marshy soil uh, due to the wetlands so these are the major soil types okay so this was all about uh, soil uh, uh, you can say technical contents of soil how it can be managed what are the things that are generally done to manage what are the threats and if we can manage the soil component then a larger part of land use uh, i mean uh, land resource can be managed from that okay so next i move on to water so um, if i have said at the starting of this lecture that li land is a la life supporting process life supporting element then i think the status of water is more than land because you might survive without food and other amenities for some time uh but without water you cannot survive so the survivability of human beings and other animals as well as all biological organisms is purely dependent on water but how much water do we have on this earth if you see this diagram over here i make it in the slide show more see the distribution of the earth's water uh, more than 70% is water of the earth but out of this fresh water is only 3% and rest 97% is saline out of this 3% fresh water also around 69% is in the ice caps and glaciers so importance of glacier is very high 30% is in the ground water and only 0.9% is in the surface water we are utilizing all these three resources actually ground water surface water as well as uh, glaciers because these glaciers are uh, uh, the sources of water to the major rivers of the world 
Surface water, again, if you see, 87% is in that lakes, 11% swamps, and 2% the rivers. So, we need to manage very efficiently this freshwater resource, what we are having. And what did I uh, say the importance of glaciers? As I've told you that, uh, yeah, most of the glaciers are in the Arctic and the Antarctic region, uh, which are inaccessible. inaccessible. Uh, but other glaciers are there throughout the world, which actually uh, supports the major rivers of the world, like Himalaya glacier is called to be the water tower of Asia. It feeds Asia's seven rivers, China, India, Burma, Pakistan, Bangladesh. They all are fed by this Himalayan glacier. Now, what is happening to this water resource and what is UN estimate? What did they predict? They predicted sorry, the 2.7 billion people will face a water shortage by 2050. Over 80 countries in the world suffer from water deficit and 1.2 billion drink unclean water. Every year, 250 million cases of water-related disease, resulting in 5 to 10 million deaths. So, uh, situation about the water resources is uh, not very satisfying here. You can see. Now, if we see the qualities or properties of water as a basic need of life, plants, animals, and human beings need water to simply live. Okay. Now, when I say water as a basic need, we focus on both the quantity as well as the quality of the water. Both matters for water to be used uh, because otherwise we have water, a lot of water in our planet. Water cannot be used. We can use only good quality water. And this has got a direct relation with sanitation and health. Uh, often women are the main sufferers in procuring safe and good water for household. And uh, this is the basic structure of water molecule. Two hydrogen atoms bound to one oxygen atom. There is... Um, Covalent bonding due to the sharing of electrons between this uh, hydrogen and oxygen atoms. And also due to their charges, they uh, experience an attraction. Oxygen uh, experiences a force of attraction with hydrogen. And due to this, there is hydrogen bonding also. So covalent bonding and hydrogen bonding, uh, yeah, uh, these two types of bonding between the hydrogen and oxygen atoms give rise to several unique properties of water. Like it's high specific heat. What happens due to that? It requires a lot of time to get heated. And once it gets heated, it releases heat also very slowly. So its specific heat capacity is very high. It's neutral pH. Think of water becoming acidic. What would have happened? So the neutral pH of water Good conductor of heat, uh, when I say good conductor of heat, uh, I'm not talking about uh, pure distilled water. Okay, uh, Here we talk about uh, river water and natural water bodies, which have a lot of ions in them. And due to the presence of the cations and anions, uh, they're splitting. And uh, they are actually responsible for conduction of heat. It exists in liquid for over a long range of temperature. It's a universal solvent. Many solutes get dissolved in it. And it's high surface tension. These are the unique properties of water. High surface tension is the reason that uh, the rate of evaporation from water bodies is always controlled. These are the uses of water. We all know the uses of water. Earth's use, human use. Okay. Starting from agriculture, drinking, landscaping, bathing, industrial, local, recreation. So several uses are there, there of water. Which, which just justifies the statement that uh, without water, life is not possible. This is again a 
detailed analysis of the consumptive and non consumptive uses uh, if you see these are the sector wise requirement or utilization of water agriculture the maximum then industrial household recreational and environmental okay and again when i say household these are the various uh, areas uh, in which water is used this is about the global water resources you can see here water surplus mainly in the northern hemisphere sufficient resources uh, very few places are there sufficient occasional shortages occasional shortages exist in china uh, in our continent in africa then uh, parts of north america as well as south america uh, the eastern coast of uh, australia also and water shortage africa and australia is having acute water shortage okay and these are the utilization pattern agriculture domestic and industry in our country the maximum is agricultural usage of water now hydrological cycle uh, so how water is circulating in the different spheres of the earth from hydrosphere to atmosphere from atmosphere to lithosphere lithosphere to hydrosphere this is how water is circulating by the process of evaporation and transpiration water is going up uh, leading to formation of clouds uh, the discondensation nuclei is there and uh, so what happens slowly slowly water droplets sling to dust particles and they form clouds now these clouds when they reach a critical mass they go for precipitation now when precipitation is happening again three things can happen one is evaporation back to the atmosphere one is surface runoff that is overland flow and another is percolation or infiltration to recharge the groundwater from groundwater also this is again getting added by overland flow and groundwater conduction water is going to the ocean so here you can see a continuous cyclic motion of water is going on this from the hydrological cycle this is very important because due to this only the different spheres of the earth different areas of the earth they receive water and vegetation has got a very important role in hydrological cycle like uh, it leads to transpiration uh, then when precipitation is happening the rainfall first falls in the canopy of the trees or plants Uh, because directly if it is falling on the surface what is happening more amount of water is going as runoff but if it is falling on the canopy of the tree then there is uh, leaf drift slowly the water is coming to the surface and it is getting absorbed by the uh, soil and finally it is going to the aquifer that is uh, recharging the ground water so vegetation has got a very important role in hydrological cycle global rainfall pattern if you see subtropical regions they do not have any orographic lifting orographic lifting happens due to certain relief features continental areas dry due to distance from moisture moisture sources away from ocean polar areas cold air cannot hold moisture equator have lot of frontal lifting this is because uh, due to the global wind circulation there is a tropical uh, zone of convergence over there over the equatorial region and due to this lot of rainfall is happening in the equatorial region that's the tropical region mid latitude cyclonic activity due to this convergence and rain shadow effect in some mountainous areas actually these are you know cause and effect of global rainfall pattern you can see due to the global circulation pattern of the wind the meeting of the northern and the southern winds at a certain place which is called the uh, tropical zone of convergence it is leading to cyclonic activities and then uh, it is leading to much rainfall in the equatorial belt or the tropical region whereas the subtropical uh, and the temperate and the polar regions are having very little rainfall now rain shadow effect is a effect which is happening in uh, tropical areas also and also other areas it is a very localized phenomenon 
whenever there is a mountainous region, uh, one side of the mountain receives the rainfall and the other side does not receive. That's called the rain shadow site. So that is again another factor which uh, controls the global rainfall pattern. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> when we are talking about the water resources, uh, we need to know about the water quality parameters. The total water quality parameters can be divided into physical parameters, chemical parameters, and biological parameters. In physical parameters, we have parameters like temperature, um, turbidity, color, odor. These are the physical parameters. Chemical parameters are a huge list of parameters. It starts from pH, total hardness, total alkalinity, acidity, um, then different ions like uh, sodium, potassium, magnesium, then uh, sulfate, nitrate, phosphate, etc. The presence of uh, metals, heavy metals, then um, Nowadays, we are getting another uh, class of contaminants, which is called the emerging contaminants, like uh, synthetic dyes, microplastics, then uh, <coughs> antibiotics, endocrine disruptors. So, a lot of things are there in the chemical list. And biological, when we talk about the biological parameters, is mainly uh, the pathogenic bacteria, uh, then the coliform bacteria. So these things, if you monitor these things, if you get the reading analytical value of these parameters of a water, you can see what is the quality of the water over there. Is it good or bad? Now, uh, often it becomes difficult to come to a conclusion from these results, you know. Uh, say you go for monitoring of 20 parameters of a water sample and you come up with a result of those values for 20 parameters. But finally, how do you conclude? whether the quality of the water is good or not. So for that, another uh, uh, technique or calculation is there. It's called the water quality index. From the water quality index, we can finally come to a conclusion that what is the quality of the water body over here. And this is very important because that tells me what is the condition of the water resource over there. Are interventions required? And if required, which are the components that need to be remedied or corrected? There are various uh, reasons for uh, water pollution, like domestic pollution. Yeah, I was saying about coliform bacteria. It's the fecal bacteria, which comes from domestic pollution. Industrial pollution, of course, you know, uh, various types of industries are there, which uh, releases different types of chemicals into the uh, water bodies, discharges them as the effluent, detergents, metals, toxic chemicals, cyanide, synthetic fertilizers, a lot of things are there, industrial pollutants. Agricultural pollution, as I have already told you, that fertilizers, synthetic fertilizers and pesticides which are given, they form a, a source of pollutants to the water. Now, um, you can see many cultivable lands covered with plastic sheets to arrest the rate of evaporation. So that again becomes a source of uh, plastic pollution as well as microplastic pollution into water bodies when there is runoff. Apart from that, uh, this leads to water logging, desertification, salinization, that means salt concentration of the water increases, agrochemicals. Construction industry, that means the debris coming out of the construction industry. So these are the different water pollution types. Impacts, first of all, the organisms who come in contact with these pollutants, plants or animals in the water body, they get affected. Uh, some of them uh, ingest these chemicals. And due to that, what happens? It travels in the higher trophic levels also in the food chain. That leads to bioaccumulation and biomagnification. Spread of infectious disease due to the presence of pathogenic organisms. Physical chemical quality impairment. That is the uh, physical and chemical properties which should be there for a good water resource. It is hampered. Okay, in our country, uh, 
all of you must have heard about Ganga Action Plan. So I'll not go into much details about that. Uh, in the first phase uh, in 1985, this Ganga Project Directorate was established and the uh, uh, finding of the Ganga Action Plan study was that uh, there are 75% uh, of the pollution load comes from untreated municipal sewage into the Ganga River. 88% of that municipal sewage is from 25 class 1 towns and industries accounted for 25% of pollution. So finally, uh, a national river action plan was there and um, they monitored, they have also set up several uh, treatment plants, community treatment, uh, sewage treatment plants, if you in treatment plants along the bank of the river Ganga to check the uh, pollution, growing pollution of the Ganga river. And again in 2014, Navami Ganga program which is an integrated conservation mission approved as flagship program by Indian government in 2014. It came up with a budgetary outlay of rupees 20,000 crore to revive this river Ganga. Okay. So in our country, this uh, Yamuna action plan is also there. So due to these uh, initiatives, uh, we are working for the uh, recovery of the water resources of Ganga. Okay, another thing that we should know when we talk about water resources is transboundary impacts. What is the meaning of this? When there are water bodies, say rivers, lakes, which are shared by two states or two nations, then if one of the state or the nation is polluting that water body, the other state faces the consequences. This is called the transboundary impact. Transboundary water is that water body which is shared by two states or nations. And transboundary impacts are faced by either one of the nations without polluting it due to the pollution created by the counterpart like downstream effects on flora, fauna, air, climate. Okay. Now, uh, if we see the history of water conflict of the world, there has been many such transboundary water conflicts. Uh, India had transboundary water conflicts with uh, Pakistan regarding Indus, with China, Indus, Brahmaputra with China, then uh, India, Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, India, China, India, Burma, India, Nepal. So we share water uh, rivers uh, from all these countries. And uh, there had been many a times that transboundary impacts has been failed. Uh, because uh, till a certain period, China was very reluctant to uh, disclose how many dams they are building in the upper course of the Brahmaputra river. So finally, what would happen? The more dams they would build over there, less water would be less water would come in the Brahmaputra, and finally we would suffer. Similarly, that was the case of Indus also, this case of Ganga also with uh, Bangladesh. So transboundary impacts has been felt all over the world. Syria, Egypt, that's a bad thing. So finally, there was there were many international efforts to uh, remediate these situations. Okay, uh, legal, administrative, economic, technical, and financial measures has been taken by many countries, riparian states. You must have heard about that riparian countries, who took many steps pertaining to legal, administrative, economic, technical, and financial to catered to this uh, uh, crisis which came up due to water sharing. Collaboration and co-repairian agreements have taken place. Like uh, you can go through this, you have it in the study material also. A uh, lot of conflicts were there. 
and not only that this to me lot of uh, international efforts has also been taken for that so finally what is the status of the water resources of india with about 4% of the water resources of the world india should have been a better adequate water adequate nation however in 2011 india turned into a water stressed nation it is currently ranked 120 among 122 countries on the water quality index as per a report by niti ayog it uses the largest amount of groundwater that is 24% of the global total more than that of china and the us combined UN report estimate by 2030 water demand in India will grow to almost 1.5 trillion cubic meters from approximately 740 billion cubic meters in 2010 this situation is further aggravated by India's water disputes with its neighboring and interstate river water disputes in India between even say uh, Tamil Nadu and uh, Andhra Pradesh interstate also disputes are there so this is the situation of the uh, water resources of our country water availability and demand water availability per person in india in the year 2001 and 2011 were 1816 and 1545 cubic meters which further came down to 1486 in 2021 and it is yet to come down to 1367 uh, in 2031 as per ministry of housing and urban affairs 135 liter per capita per day that is lpcd has been suggested as the benchmark for urban water supply for rural areas it is 55 lpcd uh, which is fixed under jal jeevan mission so you can see slowly slowly the water resources are shrinking due to two reasons one is we are using up our currently available water resources but not uh, rejuvenating those resources and second thing we are also contaminating and polluting those resources uh, dr sukalyan uh, can we go to the previous slide please so you know this yeah previous slide the water uses in urban and the rural uh, yeah this one yeah. yeah so i think this uh, the rural areas minimum service delivery 55 liter per miss uh, like liter per capita per day so i mean if you see the the, the lifestyle in rural areas like uh, specifically the sanitation you know lot of water is consumed in fl flushing the the toilets and after construction rural also now i mean you know almost every you know i i could see in many villages now people they don't go out i mean every uh, household they have toilets mm -hmm. so don't you think this water requirement will increase in rural areas as well and almost all the rural household they are using now washing machine etc so yes, they have also yes, access yes. to many gadgets yes 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 it will it will of course increase see you know things are very complicated like uh, we do not want migration of people from rural to urban areas which has been happening very consistently for the last uh, few decades we want to stop that okay we want people to be staying in rural areas so that um, the rapid urbanization that is happening it is creating a lot of problem for the environment so to revert that we would like people to stay back in the villages and for that we need to provide opportunities to them all facilities to them in the rural villages now in the process of providing facilities and opportunities to the people in the rural areas we are giving them facilities but at the same time curtailing their demands so it's a very contradictory thing what we are doing when you are saying that Uh, the demand in the rural areas is bound to increase yes of course it is bound to increase and we should keep that in mind when we are going for uh, resource development for urban areas i am saying it 135 lpcd whereas for rural 55 lpcd now if the opportunities and facilities are same in both urban and rural areas of course this has to be 
at least very close figures but we are not doing that uh, this is <laughs> a lot of controversies you know are actually there regarding these things but yes this is the said value now uh, we can express our uh, views for that but these are said values yeah got it now and if you see the uh, this is the pattern of the uh, water resources of the world maximum is there in the north america oceania uh, east is i mean uh, asia is in between and the african countries sub saharan african countries are having the least amount of water available so dynamics of water use is the key to solution that means we need to know how much is utilized so that we can uh, Uh, plan out, take management steps to uh, conserve the water resources. So first of all, for that I need spatial and temporal uh, monitoring. Spatial is with respect to location. What are the uh, different demands uh, resource present over there? How much is the gap? And temporal means with respect to time. How is it changing? so determination of suitable solution for finding best way to allocate scarce and strongly varying amount of available water four major areas have been identified for this rainfall pattern uh, i mean if i want to get the spatial and temporal data of the water resource of a place i need to go for these four points rainfall pattern river discharge or reservoir release reservoir volume and locally stored runoff this determines the water budget of that place so from that i can take uh, required measures for water management water resource management climate change is at the same time affecting the global water resources uh, as it is the forecast of ipcc that extreme event frequency and magnitude will increase and basically this belt uh, south asia faces the wrath of much of this uh, extreme events yes the international efforts that i was talking about you can go through this chronological development of the international efforts that has been happening and finally we are here with the sdg goal 6 that is ensure access to water and sanitation for all so unique water conservation methods these are some of the unique water conservation methods uh, rain water harvesting check dams mulching vegetation plantation to uh, check erosion plowing contour farming fog and dew sometimes used directly for adaptive species Uh, desalination technique drip irrigation interlinking linking of canals though interlinking of rivers is again a controversial issue so these are some of the unique water conservation methods many of which has been adopted till date uh, in fulfilling the sdg 6 and uh, but uh, the magnitude of this acceptance and uh, implication or uh, you can say implementation of these things is more required throughout our country as well as the world for effective management of water resources so that was all about water resource management uh, we have discussed in this lecture about land resources soil resources and water resources they are unique properties they are technical properties their uses the unsustainable practices and finally how the management is done okay so now i think the session is open for question answers if you